kill data, and uh, then all of a sudden uh, we really realized the kind of risks in this industry of that happening. So food safety's changed a great deal, and uh, so we looked at some other technology that uh, would help us uh, understand the quality of carcass we have, and uh, Mark Henry is the owner of uh, the laboratory that does the ultrasound work, and we're really pleased to have Mark here to talk to us about uh, ultrasound, its application in this industry, and we certainly know that um, that even experience of quality beef is very important to our customers. Mark, thanks for being here. Rex, thank you. Uh, appreciate the Charlie Association bringing me in to speak. So uh, if you got questions, feel free to raise your hand, shout them out as I'm going through this. I have no problem answering them as I go. Bill covered some things that are going to be in some of my slides, so we'll shuffle through those kind of quickly. But anyway, I just wanted to bring you up to date on kind of what's going on with ultrasound. Uh, I know it's, if you've seen any scanning done, you're familiar with what that picture is, and that's a picture of a ribeye. Um, when Bill said EPDs are approaching 50 years of age, I started to think, and I'm like, okay, I remember going to a sale in Ida Grove, Iowa with my father, and we were just talking about weaning weight ratios and birth weight ratios and trying to learn that stuff, and I'm kind of like, holy crap, it's been a while. I'm getting old, but... <clears throat> I've been around ultrasound for 20 years, and I'm thinking this is starting to get old too. And I've seen a million of these things plus, um, but I'll tell you what, the thing is, it's been an effective tool. And uh, even though sometimes it seems like it's just a uh, same old, same old, it is, it is an effective tool. I'm not sure how well these are gonna ship up in here, but I did bring, a, we just had a set of cattle came through yesterday, which had some real nice variation in the, a group that was in a being um, right at 2% intermuscular fat all the way up to 85 to 9%. So the upper left was about 2%. This one over here on the right was about 4.5%. Then we got about a 9% on this IMF on the bottom. Just to kind of show you some differences in how those look in terms of what we see. The little red box you see on there and the red uh, that you saw on the ribeye tracing there actually is my tracing on this data. So we'll, we still hand trace this stuff. Um, we've tried to talk about doing computers uh, to do more of this. Uh, first of all, it's a very expensive process, but two, it takes a while to get those models developed. And honestly, I think we do a better job by hand and I haven't been proven wrong just yet. So anyway, moving on. Uh, everybody knows what a ribeye area is. It's just between the 12th and 13th rib, the longest was dorsi muscle. Rib fat is the fat measured at the three-quarter position, away from the midline of the animal, um, on that rib or on that LD muscle. Uh, intermuscular fat, IMF, I'll call it a bunch of different things, but it is in ultrasound, it's the percent of fat inside the LD muscle. We also measure that in carcasses by taking a rib sliver, uh, and that's how we develop our software. We take rib slivers off of carcasses, we take it to a lab, and they do either extraction to get the amount of fat that's in that muscle. So that's what we use to try to get ourselves put together with a good model to move forward. But intermuscular fat for, uh, on a carcass is marbling. And marbling score, obviously, I think you guys all know what that is. It's just a visual appraisal. Uh, since we've had the uh, uh, upgrades in a lot of the plants using the cameras. I think that marbling scores become a lot more consistent across the country, which is really nice to see. Um, and it really, I think it's enhanced the, uh, the ability for us to actually score those cattle more correctly. Uh, statistical terms, I don't want to get too deep into this stuff. The correlation is important. Obviously, it's the measurement of, of, of the relationship between two traits, standard deviation, uh, when I'm talking about that, it'll become something I'll talk a little bit about in another slide. But we're talking about the amount of variation. So the larger that number, the more variation we've got. And when we're selecting for any trait, obviously if we've got a lot of variation, we've got a lot of movement that we can make. As Bill was showing those two population curves, we're trying to move the curve. Well, you've got to have variation. If you don't have much variation, it's kind of hard to move that trait. Uh, beans, average of the measurement, standard error prediction, that's just uh, a stat we'll use when we develop our models and when we get them uh, approved, uh, that's a, a measurement of error. So similar to uh, just how, how far off are we on each measurement, things like that. So that comes up. 
genetic correlation. Uh, Bill talked about that, but uh, it's the portion of various uh, that two traits share due to genetics. So genetic correlation comes into play for us with ultrasound because we are not measuring actual carcass traits. We're measuring ultrasound traits. But the good news is they're highly genetically correlated, so we can use them to get us to improve carcass traits. And then heritability, we'll talk about that as well. So uh, This is from 2019, this is Charlotte data. Um, we're talking about heritability. And the heritability is on the diagonal. So the ultrasound, got a light here. The ultrasound, uh, uh, U percent IMF, is heritability of 0.23. Decent, moderate, not, not the greatest. Ultrasound ribeye, though, is pushing that moderate to high, where Bill said about 0.4 and above is high. So we're right there with ultrasound uh, ribeye. And ultrasound fats just kind of on that moderate level on the upper end of moderate. If we get into the carcass traits, we've got more moderate high on the carcass marbling, which obviously that should be the case because that's the trait we're, we're chasing. We're chasing carcass marbling. Carcass ribeye actually is a little bit lower than ultrasound ribeye, and uh, carcass fats also lower than uh, ultrasound. Now, there's two reasons for that. Um, one big reason for that, and um, Number one, the way we collect our ribeye images, which is we collect the ribeye area and the fat thickness, we are far more consistent than you're gonna get in any packing plan in terms of how we do that. So we're very consistent with that. Um, the measurements are very consistent. So that's why we're gonna get a better high heritability. But in the packing plan, you've got several factors that are gonna impact what that ribeye size looks like, um, depending on how that carcass is split and how they make that cut to open that ribeye facing up. They also have hide pullers. Hide pullers, trim, things like that can really affect carcass fat. So that is why I think uh, the main reasons why our heritabilities are better on those two traits. The nice thing is that we're talking about carcass marbling compared to ultrasound percent IMF, the genetic correlation is a 0.68. Very high, carcass ribeye, carcass fat, all 0 0.68, 0 0.7, so that's great. Just for a point of comparison, um, this is from the Angus website, and this is from actually from last year, but we do have a little bit more uh, heritability in the ultrasound IMF. Uh, ribeye is exactly the same. Ultrasound fat is a little bit higher there as well. And we get into the carcass traits, we're higher across the board on those, or excuse me, on the, on the marbling, but the carcass ribeye is about the same, the carcass fat's a little higher. Now my theory on that is the main reason why that is is because of the fact that we've got a little bit more variation in intermuscular fat and carcass marbling and also a little bit more in ultrasound fat and carcass fat. So I think that gives them an advantage to have a little bit more variation so they've got a little bit higher heritability on that. But as you can see, actually the heritabilities are very similar. Carcass marbling is 0.71, with Charlotte was 0.68 uh, to ultrasound. Uh, IMF, and then the ribeyes, 0.65, so and carcass fat was just a little bit lower than we, they were with Charlet, they were 0.7. So, either way, the good news is, using ultrasound, we can find carcass traits. Uh, took a look at genetic trends over the last 29 years, and Bill had some slides up there to show the most recent. Um, I think ribeye has jumped to a 0.69 in 2018, and so we started with 1990, and then I compared it to 2018 off the uh, genetic trends and the average. So we're dealing with um, some nice changes over the years with all the traits, and I agree with Bill. It's like good spread of not one thing that you're trying to get good at. Um, the one thing I would say that maybe we have some opportunity for improvement on is going to be your marbling, because as I saw his slide from this year, it's still a .10. So I think we've got some opportunities to try to lay cattle if that's the direction you want to go to improve that number a little bit. Compared to Angus, very similar in terms of the amount of change we've seen in weaning weight and yearling weight. The numbers may be a little bit bigger, but they've got an advantage in a lot more numbers of cattle being registered and selected, therefore they're gonna have uh, probably faster selection, but all the same trends. The only thing different is that we've got a little bit more of a trend in Angus cattle um, to have a little bit more marbling. So we took a look at some data, and. Everything seems like same old, same old. Over the years, um, 
I mean, I think people think ultrasound is ultrasound. But, oh, three years ago, four years ago, I guess it'd be now, we started looking at uh, having to develop some new models for some new systems because the machines that guys were using out there, guys and gals were using out there, were not uh, going to be serviced anymore. They're not going to be available for sale anymore. And I'll tell you, sometimes we, we take it for granted that these machines they run about $20,000 a pop, and uh, they're, not, they're not the easiest things to play with sometimes. If you drop a transducer while you're out scanning, you might be out five to $10,000 in a heartbeat. So we needed to look for some new, new equipment and get something going. We did that. We developed some new models. And the nice thing was that we took a fresh new approach to how we developed the intermuscular fat models. Rib eyes and rib fat, pretty simple to measure, pretty simple those calculated, I don't have any issue with that. But the intermuscular fat is the important one for us. And so, as we looked at the data, and we looked at what our old models were doing, we were not happy with how they were spreading the cap. We were concerned that that needed to be a little bit more, and so, as we developed the new system, we really worked on trying to make sure we were trying to identify cattle on the ends, so the, the mover cattle, whether they're gonna move it lower or higher, we want those end cattle to be a little farther apart from the mean than what they've been in the past. What we're looking at here, oh great, there we go. What we're looking at here is, I think it's nine, eight or nine different herds. The bulls and the heifers from the same herd are on the same line. So if you're going horizontally that top line, we've got uh, 332 heifers, and then they also scan 291 bulls, same year. You see their average IMF percent was 5.71. Uh, the I percent IMF standard deviation in the second column there was 1.88 on the heifers. Fat thickness was 0.2. Uh, so you come over to the bulls and you've got 291. IMF standard deviation 1.03, 5.1 your percent IMF average. So not very far off. Those bulls pretty highly marbled for a set of bulls. And average fat was uh, 0.22. So not really fat, certainly not animals that I would consider to be, you know, super fat. I'm sure there were cattle in that group that would have been, you know, four tenths or better, but uh, that was the average. Just go on down through the list, and there's, like I said, eight or nine different breeds, breeder in here. Uh, I know we've got Angus in here, I know we've got Hereford, I know we've got Charlay, we might have a set of Red Angus in this group. I can't remember exactly, but I think that's right. You get down to the bottom, and we've got 1,500, Heifers, we have 1,200 bulls, and our percent standard deviation point of this slide ultimately is that we've got a lot more variation in the heifers than we do in the bulls with exactly the same fat thickness or you know, statistically the same fat thickness. So it kind of got us thinking we need to start talking more about scanning our replacement females. And uh, for those folks that are trying to improve their genetics, this is a good way to try to do this a lot faster. Uh, I'm going to step back real quick and talk about our system that we uh, certif our software we certified here in 2017. Uh, started that development in 2016. Took over a year for us to get developed and certified. But we've got a set of cattle and 90, 95, or excuse me, 75 head up in the left hand corner there. All we're going to do is talk about the mean of intramuscular fat from the ether extraction, the minimum, the maximum spread. So it was high to low and then the standard deviation within that data set on the ether extraction. So that's your, that's your set of cattle that are your um, carcass data. So we were trying to mimic that as best as we possibly could. Model one, model two, those are some older models that we've used in the past. And when I get right down to it, all I really care about from my perspective is that we spread the cattle, that we give them more, a larger standard deviation or something that closely matched the standard deviation of the ether extracts. And so, obviously model one, model two, not bad, 1.43, 1.41, um, but when we had our new models, that's where we really were excited, because we saw a lot more standard deviation. So we were able to spread those cattle better, and be able to identify the low end and the high end much better than what we've had in the past. So that was exciting news, and that's only happened in the last three years, so, uh, we're working through that right now. A lot of technicians are using some older technology that would be Model 1 and Model 2. Still good. Correlations are about identical. 
0 0.79, 0 0.78, 0 0.77. So we're right in that 0.8 area, all of them, which is really good. Standard error prediction is about 1% for all of them, but we got more spread. And it's being noticed. I've heard that from different breeders that had calls on it. It's like, hey, why are we spread these cattle a lot more? And I said, that's great because now you can identify those lower and those higher cattle. And if you want to select for whatever, if you want lower IMF, I don't care. You select what you like. So hopefully that improves the EPD. So uh, we start talking about why people need to start scanning heifers and why is it different than bulls? Well, lack of testosterone is the big one. Uh, loss for expression of intermuscular fat and external fat as well. But that intermuscular fat really starts to show up. Uh, I think selfishly, if I were a breeder, my thought would be, hey, I'm going to scan my heifers because I get to keep that data. Those are the girls that are going to come back in. Those are going to be my replacements. And uh, I can make some really good improvement on whatever trade I'm looking at, whether it be ribeye or IMF or fat thickness or all of them. So that's what I would do that for. And it's going to help their calves and their bull calves and the EPD accuracy when you're selling calves out of them. Uh, scan data on heifers, and bulls for that matter, and bulls, that's the only opportunity that that animal will ever have to be able to actually give a data point to contribute to their EPD for carcass trade. So you're not going to lock their heads off. And genomics, as good as it is, it doesn't give you that. It doesn't give you a ribeye size. It doesn't give you an IMF or a fat thickness. Um, I already said that, heifers are a scan gift for yourself. And then also, if you're trying to improve animals, uh, uh, improve sires or you know, improve their uh, EPD accuracies, and uh, two scan groups, what bulls and heifers are going to increase that uh, a lot faster and uh, a lot, lot quicker for your other sires and even on your dams too. But more phenotypes, we get to discover more outliers. Um, so, you know, genomics aren't perfect. Obviously, there's genetic recombination, there's mutations, there's other things that go on. And so that's why everybody keeps talking about the need for phenotypes. You got to keep getting those phenotypes in there to prove the genotypes so that they can discover the new genes or the new markers and to uh, keep working with single step to improve that and make that go faster. So large variation in heifer marbling EPDs uh, allows for some faster advancement there as well. Okay. So obviously we want the, to uh, provide uh, your customers with the genetics to reap the rewards. So the better ones go on the market, they're selling those heavy calves, but not only those calves heavy, I like Bill's slide, I'm not selling lead, I'm selling gold, okay? I'd rather sell gold than lead by the pound, I guarantee you that. So that's a good, a good analogy. In the commercial side, if you were our commercial producer, we've had several, uh, and continue to have several producers that'll go in and scan a group of heifers um, and just try to wean out the ones they like and the ones they don't like. There's a few problems with it. It's not as accurate as what we're going to get with EPDs, but if the cattle are all about the same age and have been treated about the same and come from the same operation, we feel comfortable that we can actually get some variation in there and they can go ahead and scan for larger ribeyes and scan for IMF and uh, make some selection choices that are going to help them out. Um, Obviously, I would always say don't just scan and use that as your only trait. You're going to be using other traits for calving ease and things like that and, and milk and growth. You've got to use all those traits as well. So we don't want a single trait select. If you happen to be raising your own bulls um, and they're coming out of that same herd, uh, the one thing I would say is that those cattle um, probably have the same weaknesses and strengths that, that your, your heifers do. So keep that in mind. But uh, you know what you're getting if you're going to do that job. So. Uh, yeah, obviously you want to select some sires that are going to comp complement what you're weak in. So that's why when we talk about uh, Angus Charlotte cross cattle, Jackie had talked about that. It's like, that's great. You know, it's, they're, they're complementary because you're going to get a lot of yield out of those cattle. You're going to get big ribeyes. Um, you're going to get marbling and all the other and the growth traits uh, with Charlotte and Angus, but you're going to get the, more of the marbling from the, from the Angus cattle right now. So... Uh, uh, we are big believers in EPDs and genetic evaluations. Use them if you can. If you don't have them, well, come up with uh, something a little bit. If you've got some scan data, that'll at least be something if you're a commercial producer. But uh, the nice thing with single step now is genomics and phenotypes are tied together immediately. So that is great. So we, we're really excited about that. Um, 
The one thing that I said earlier was that genomics, you're not going to find those outliers due to genetic, uh, genetic mutations or recombination. So um, you're still going to have to do the phenotypes as genetics continue to change. Um, without phenotypes and genomic testing, uh, without your phenotypes being tested, so you're not doing the genomics and doing the phenotypes by doing the scanning, you know, your herd's not reflected in the genetic testing. So if you're going to do it, you want to get included so that your cattle specifically, your genetics are included, you're going to have to do both because that's the best way to get you included and uh, to get you the most bang for your buck out of the scan and, and uh, genomic testing as well. Um, and just by default, the way we train genomics, it's going to trail the phenotypes of the low waves. So, uh, New genes, new new markers aren't discovered, and it's like one bull had it. And great, congratulations, we found it. I don't know what the number is, but I know it takes a little while for them to get a population of cattle and have a trait in a gene that's going to pop up, or a uh, marker that's going to pop up for a trait that's either positive or negative. I'm done. Any questions? Mark, I have a talk about this. Yes, you're asking about the models. Uh, every model is specific to every ultrasound machine. So each machine has its own model, and it even goes down to another level where we've got frame grabbers. So how you capture that image matters to us in terms of how what model we're going to use to interpret those images for IMF and for relay size too. But that's that's simple. Um, so the validation process is done by the Ultrasound Guidelines Council. And they sit underneath the USB Breeds Council. So we'll kill, and that data I showed you, 75 head of cattle that died for UGC. So what we did was we killed them, we scanned those cattle. Uh, I think that group happened to be scanned with about six different systems, because we were trying to certify about four or five of them. And we scanned those cattle. They went to harvest, we sent in the data. We went and got rib slivers did the ether extracts, and that's how they made the comparison on 75 head. Correlation just on ether extract to barbling score is somewhere in the 80s. It's not perfect, but it's pretty high. So it, it, it's good. Obviously, with the amount of cattle breeding choice every year seems to be on the rise, the amount of prime cattle. I mean, what you guys are doing is working, so keep it up. Any other questions for Mark? Let's give Mark a big hand. Thanks for being here, Mark. Thank you.